Recording. Oh, yes, it says you are. We're recording. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Crotzer, the editor in chief of the Vaughn Bugle, and I'm here today with my friend Angelica Shirley Carpenter to talk about all sorts of things, but most importantly, her new picture book, uh, The Voice of Liberty, and her other accomplishments in the arena um, of Oz and related to Oz. And uh, so, hi, Angelica. Thanks for joining me today. Hi. Right, thank you for inviting me. Let's let, let's let's start at the beginning. How how did you how did you first encounter Oz? Well, in in my family, I'm the third generation Oz fan. Um, my mother loved Oz as a child, and her uncle was only nine years older than she was, and he loved Oz as a child. Um, he was born in 1910, so he was like a big brother to my mother. He okay. was born in 1910, and when he was a child living in St. Louis, his family, his father was a musician. Somebody took him to a traveling musical of The Wizard of Oz. Now, this must have been the original show of Al Frank Baum that was yes. on the road at this time. So I don't know how old Gordon was, but he was maybe, you know, five or six or seven. Yeah, he came home from the show and he picked out all the songs on the piano. But the thing he liked the very best was the orchestra. And he said, I'm going to be a conductor when I grow up. And he did become a conductor. A very famous one in the 40s and 50s. And also a lifelong Oz fan. So he had this big career where he recorded with Frank Sinatra and Peggy Lee and had hit records. And um, all of it started because of Oz and because of that show, which I think is just weird. <laughs> it's pretty great, yeah, actually. Anyway, my mother loved Oz. Yeah, isn't it cool? Isn't yeah. It cool? So, mother inherited Oz books from her uncle, and then I inherited books from her. And but I was the first Oz nut. Okay, I mean they liked Oz. Yes. Yeah. I was crazy. Um, and people say, oh, the, did they have first editions? Well, this is my mother's Oz one of Oz. Mm -hmm. Um. It's so like a 20s one, isn't it? These are well-loved books. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 1928. Yeah. in here that says um, to Jean from um, Mom. And then there's my, I put in a book plate. And you see, I don't know if you can read it, but I'm no. going to be a librarian then. But I had him on shelf B. Oh, uh, I wrote that in there. So these books are pretty much destroyed, but they have really been loved, okay? That's perfect. <laughs> um, I hear I hear you got in trouble for reading some edition of the book you just held up to me. Maybe that one. Um, I have I don't remember the first time I heard an Oz book, but you know, it was probably you know the day after I was born, but when I was in second grade, I had finished my assignment, whatever it was, and I happened to have an Oz book in my desk, and I got it out, and I started reading, and I got in trouble for doing it, you know. And the next day, my mother went up to school, and she told Miss Spitzer to let me read Oz. <laughs> so I appreciated that. Absolutely. That's my first memory that I, I mean, that's, I was reading by that time. So I don't know who read it to me first. Um, now, I, I know who your mother is, and I hate to jump forward a little bit, but I'll, we'll, we'll come back and forth, because this is a book from my childhood, which oh. <laughs> I remember pretty well. Um, this was a sacred text to me oh, when I was okay. about 10 years old. Uh, and actually, my, my mother has put it in, like, plastic to protect it from my... Childish yearnings, but um, <laughs> you wrote a whole. Am I am I right in thinking you wrote a whole series of these with your mother? You wrote four. You wrote well, four. I three with her. Three okay. With her. And she was Jean Shirley. Um, and you guys did uh, L. Frank Baum, obviously. You did Lewis Carroll. Is that right? I did that one by myself. You did that one by yourself. I'm sorry. You did Francis Hodgson Hodgson Burnett then together. Yeah, that's and, our first one. And the other one would be Stevenson, Robert Louis yes. Stevenson? Okay. Yes. Why those four people? Well, we, we, both, we 
both actually really loved the Secret Garden too, okay. as children. Both read it and loved it. And um, we, when my mother retired, she was living in St. Louis, which is where I were from. But I was running a public library in South Florida. And mother retired and she moved down there and she thought we should start writing books together. And um, it's a long story, but she had found this autobiography by Frances Hodgson Burnett about her childhood. And she thought that would make a good basis for um, a biography that we would write. And, you know, I said, I don't want to write. I think I was a writer. Although, you know, now that I look back on it, I had always been like a newsletter editor or I had always written letters, or I was writing silly poems, but I think I was a writer. But, you know, she persisted, and after two years, I finally read this book, the one I needed best of all. And by then, of course, we knew there was no children's biography of Frances Hodgson. Well, there was one that was written by her daughter-in-law, but it left out things like her divorce, you know, and her second marriage, and anything that embarrassed the family. So anyway, we, we, we wrote that and we had a great time. It was lucky our editor at the Learner Publications in Minneapolis had just taken a children's literature course and she had written her term paper on Burnett. So she picked it out of the slush pile and called us up one night. It was great. <laughs> and then after that, Learner had a pre-approved list of people they wanted biographies. Again, these are for like middle grade, four to six kids and the, the two names I remember were James Baldwin and Leo Tolstoy for kids. So Lerner and I said, well, that's crazy. How about L. Frank Baum? <laughs> and Lerner said, oh, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. So they let us do that. Okay. Although I I, I personally okay. would have liked to have read the Tolstoy children's biography. Well, they, they published one. Oh, no. You can read it. <laughs> I don't know that they ever got around to Baldwin, but they did publish Tolstoy. Okay, well, Christmas, here I come. Um, <laughs> and I've taken the cover, the, the jacket off now, so that everyone yeah. can see the art a little bit more. Uh -huh. But um, this is a pretty, you know, this is a hefty little tome for a children's biography. you got a lot going on here. There's all sorts of pictures, which I've got to tell you, Angelica, I know that I poured over every single one of these pictures. Well, I love the I love the pictures, and I I love the design of that book with the little pictures at the beginning of the chapter headings. I mean, they did such a beautiful job. Um, they hired an artist to do the cover, and the first cover that that person did was really weird. I forget it was a man or a woman that did did his or her own Oz interpretations, and they were awful. So I complained, and they they had had it redone and those pictures on the front now look much like much more like Neil drawings. Yeah. Because I love John R. Neil. He's he's my big oh, thing. Mine you know, too. I love him. Right. So anyway, I'm that book was just beautiful and, and I'm so proud of it. And and I had some input into which pictures were used and where, which is unusual actually. Well it's it's still a book that I recommend to people if their if their children are interested in Bob and so um much to my delight, though, this isn't where you stopped. We should backtrack a little bit. I am, um, well, we met at the 2017 National Convention, right? Is that correct? Yeah. In, yeah, that's right. In Chicago. In Chicago, that's absolutely right. And you were, you made sure that I, I, I knew where everything was and how to get there and didn't lose track of where the group was and so on. You were like my my big sister for a couple of days there. It was really nice of you. It was fun. And um but I I've just talked to you recently and you told me that this is kind of something that you felt when you first came into the club, which I assume was a, a little bit further ago than 2017. Um but talk to me how you became involved with the club please and what that was like. You know, I, again, I cannot really remember my first time with the club. I think I may have read about it in um, the annotated Wizard of Oz mm -hmm. in 1973. So, but I didn't go to any meetings until that bomb biography came out. So that was in the early 90s. 
because most of that time I lived in South Florida and I didn't have any money. I just couldn't afford to go. You know, the meetings weren't in South Florida. I couldn't afford to go. I went, the first meeting I went to, I, had, I went to high school in St. Louis and I went to a high school reunion. And so I just could drive up to Chicago and went to an Osmopolitan convention. That was the first one I went to. And, um, and I did feel, you know, I can stand up in front of two or 300 people and talk and I love it and I'm not shy at all. But to walk into a room full of people who all have known each other since childhood, and I was in my 40s, you know, that's a little scary. But like, I remember, the thing I remember best about that conference is that Peter Hamp made a big point of coming over at dinner and introducing himself and welcoming me to the club. I thought, oh, Peter Hamp, you know, and I read his stuff in the Google and um, so, and honestly, he does that all the time. He's just such a good example for us all. So I try to do that, even though I'm shy. Um, well, even when I was president, even when I became president, I still felt kind of like on the outer fringes of some of it, you know? Because okay. I hadn't been a member since I was a kid. And mm -hmm. they all had, they'd all known each other 20 or 30 years, and, um, or 20 anyway. So, but I thought when I was president, I thought, Okay, you have to go to the parties. I'm really shy about mm -hmm. parties. You have to go to the parties. And you have to go and you can have one drink and then you can leave, okay? And I just made myself do it. And of course I had a good time. <laughs> it was yeah. really fun. You know, gradually I I think I learned that now I I look out for newcomers and I welcome them. And I've met such such interesting people that way. Um Sometimes people come, I t we were talking earlier um, before we started recording about whether there are more men or more women in the club, and I find that a lot of times when new people are women, and they may not come back year after year, but they come to a location where the club is meeting men, and they're just so interesting, and, and they come from such varied, but the men do too, the men do sure. too, you know, it's, so I make the point of, um, trying to meet everybody. I don't think I do it as well as Peter, but but I try to follow his example. You've I'm brought up a couple things now I've got to got to turn to. Now obviously when we talk about Oz or the Oz Club, we think about a couple of things, right? We think about the books, we think about L. Frank Baum, we think about maybe our favorite Oz movies, the Judy Garland movie, other no, okay. <laughs> I tried everyone, but no. Um, but I guess what I'm leading to is that probably relatively few people think of Oz and they think, let's talk about women's suffrage. Right. And for anyone who doesn't know, this is, this is Angelica's uh, biography of uh, Matilda Jocelyn Gage. Um, who is L. Frank Baum's mother-in-law, so the mother of his of his wife Maud. This came out very shortly after I met you. I think it's a wonderful book. Thank you. I'm a little bit ashamed of myself how little I knew about this woman before I read this book, um, and probably the little bit I knew is from your earlier book. <laughs> so but, but look at this thing. This is a nice. This is a truly chunky biography. And I just, I mean, I told you I reread quite a bit of it in preparation for this interview. And two things really struck me about it. First of all, the, just the wonderfully clear prose. It's extremely readable. Um, and I know that, and I, I'm not sure how you feel about this, that it was published as a young adult. Yeah. biography but if it weren't for the three tiny little words that tell me that on the dust jacket i would never have guessed it's just a and i i, I was so grateful to get it published i would have liked it as a graphic novel i think you know okay. i mean i have been shopping it around for years uh south dakota historical society press offered to publish it i, I pitched it both ways as an adult biography and a young adult, because I've written these other books for young people. So I don't write any differently for adults or young people. Mm -hmm. And I've been really lucky that I don't have publishers that limit my vocabulary or anything like that. 
I think it's just as it's just shorter than most, you know, if it were a full scale adult biography, it would look like, you know, Ron Chernow Hamilton or something, 700 pages long. Yeah. But it's not that long, it's shorter. And then I think it kind of got lost as a young adult biography. All the reviews said that it was good for general audiences and maybe for undergraduate classes. Mm -hmm. and I like that. And for me, it's for anyone, but it depends on, you know, all people say, well, you should. You shouldn't have called it that. Well, it's not up to me. It's up to the publisher. But it also depends on who they send to review. You know, will they send it to young adult reviewers or will they send it to adult reviewers? And know what contests will you enter it in? It did win a prize for young adult biography from the Midwest book, something or other. And um, it just depends on how it's marketed. Okay. To me, as the author, I, it doesn't make much difference to me. I was so proud. Well, another reason it's young adult is it has so many pictures in it. Well, that's actually and what I, I was going to say next. Is is something that fascinates me is I see a direct relationship to your earlier book on L. Frank Baum yeah. because it's full of wonderful pictures. This is um. Oh, I'm going to hold this up badly, but it's the the earliest known photo of Matilda. And she's what, 22 or 23? Yes. Here's something like that. Um, yes. But it's full of wonderful photos, not just of Matilda, but of her, her family and her colleagues and her enemies and the people who were in control of the government at this time. Um, there's a picture of Frederick Douglass I've never seen before. And it really brings the text which is already quite readable to life. And so, I mean, this is something I, I teach at a community college and I've recommended this to several students already. Um, well, Nancy Copal is the publisher, or was the publisher then of the South Dakota Historical Society Press. And when I write a book like that, I'm always compiling pictures and putting them in files. So even though the press was the one that acquired the pictures, thank God, I didn't have to do that. I sent them, you know, lists of pictures. Anyway, I asked her how many pictures it is it going to have, and she said, "Oh, the more the merrier." Well, that is so wonderful from a publisher because it cost them money. I wasn't paying for those pictures; they were. And um, I don't know if it increases the cost of production of the book. I don't even know that, but I just thought that was wonderful and um, and I had again I got to work on the pictures on that book. Jennifer McIntyre was the person who acquired the pictures and um, decided where they should go I think and the book designer and so I had a lot of input into the pictures too in this book. Again that's very unusual you know but they they listen to me I appreciate it too. You said that this is a book you've been shopping around for a long time. What I really want to know is why Matilda? I mean I guess once I now now that I've read the book, I think to myself, why not Matilda? Yeah. But tell us, please, why why should we want to know more about Matilda Gage? That's a way to put it. Oh, okay. Well, the reason why Matilda, why I picked Matilda was when I wrote that mom biography with mother, Matilda sort of seemed got on our radar then, you know, I didn't know much about her. But then um in two 2008, I think, I first met Sally Roche Wagner, who is the primary scholar about Matilda Jocelyn Gage. And I heard her talk and I read some of her research. And then I really got interested. Then I had an Oz convention here in Fresno. Too bad you couldn't come to that one. And Sally came and she gave me a talk about Matilda. And that just did it. I just thought, I got to write the book. So I asked Sally, you know, would that be a good idea? And, I look for young people, and she said, that's what I usually write is for young people. And she said yes, and she helped me. She read it and, um, you know, made corrections, and so did Michael Patrick Hearn. And, you know. So that's why Matilda. Now, if you want to know why Matilda, why she's famous, she just was the most interesting person. Matilda was right up there with Miss Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Uh, worked very closely with them. And yet, when she died, she died first. They kind of wrote her out of history. Now, why did they do that? Well, 
she was by far the most radical, all those kids the most funny out there, okay? Right. Matilda never compromised. So after they'd all been working together for like 30 years, um, Susan B. Anthony was ready to let some things go, like equal pay for equal work. Maybe she'd let that go and just go for suffrage. And she was ready to make deals with people like the Women's Christian Temperance Union, who wanted to put God in the Constitution and Jesus in the public schools, and had 200,000 members. Right. And Matilda would not make a deal with anyone like that. She thought there should be a separation of church and state. So she had a falling out with Susan B. Anthony rather late in life. And then she was very disappointed that Stanton stuck with Anthony because really Stanton and Matilda were much more like philosophically. Uh, so that's the time passed and Matilda died and the other two wrote their own versions or had, had them written. Um, the women's version, and they just left her out. So that's why you haven't heard of her. But you should have heard of her because she was wonderful. Unlike them, she believed in equal rights for everybody, every race, every religion, whether you spoke English or not, whether you were educated or not. She didn't care. You got equal rights. They were inherent. And she never forgot about working women. That was very important, but not so important to the rest of the movement. Um, she worried about where would working women live how would they get educated how could they earn money she thought prostitution was um an economic problem not a moral issue the way you know the way it was looked at then and then on top of all of that she was just a superb organizer and brain and a historian she was one of the main writers for the movement she and Stanton. and she developed patterns like she established the New York Women's Suffrage Association, and then she went down to Virginia and replicated the format and started that organization. And, you know, she just had a, a knack for organization and also for civil disobedience. She had really great ideas for civil disobedience, which she again implemented all over the country through her writing for newspapers and um, she just was amazing. And she did it right up to the day she died, and she didn't ever get tired and stop. She just kept on going. And the thing I liked about her the best, just personally, me, is her father, who was a big influence on her, taught her that if she encountered opposition or criticism, that meant she was doing something right. And I just love that. You know, I wish I could believe that about me. <laughs> I wish I could be that way. But she really believed that. You know. But she encountered plenty of opposition and criticism, and it just made her feel really good. <laughs> yeah. But she was I mean, a fabulous woman. Uh, and while I was writing this, my husband got to be a big Matilda fan, too. And now he wants to get the word out about Matilda. I mean, she's just great. I mean, uh, reading again, what really struck me is that she's sort of constantly in motion, right? She never yeah. really stays settled for long at all she's always reaching reaching out for the next the next goal in in her quest for equal rights and as you were just saying her expression of, right. of equal rights as being for everyone that she isn't she isn't turning against immigrants she isn't turning against people of color she isn't turning against the american indians she isn't denigrating people who are poorer than she is or anything like that. It's always a very consistent um, message of equality for every person everywhere, which is very stirring. She really believed that people have inherent rights, you know, the rights of life, liberty, and happiness or whatever. And that it was her job to enlighten the world about this and to convince the world that this was true. Whereas other people believed that, well, suffrage was good, like, you know, the Women's Christian Temperance Union wanted suffrage so they could vote in um, prohibition. <laughs> but Matilda always had a higher cause and um, stuck to it. Well, and the, and the word that you've used in the title, radical, I think is so appropriate because I found myself stopping a few times and just really thinking to myself how 
dramatic some of these statements she was making were. I mean, her uh, her first major speech, if I've got this correct, to um, an assembly of women is literally just recounting all the great women who have already done things in history that should be honored and remembered going forward. And later in life, she's making very specific strikes against established Christian doctrine, which is, I mean, that's just a, I almost can't believe that in, in someone living at that time, and particularly a woman. And it's just think, staggering. If she, if she were alive today, I think she would still be radical. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind. She just, that's how she was. That's how she was. That first speech she gave about all these important, because most of the people at that at that convention in 1852 talked about what women might do if they were given the chance. You know, right. They could go to college and could have certain jobs. But Matilda talked about what women had already done, had already mm -hmm. accomplished. And something I read said it made people ask, well, why wasn't I taught this? Why wasn't I taught this history? And that's exactly what people thought in the 1970s when in the second phase of the women's movement, Matilda kind of got rediscovered and people read her books and said, well, why was, I mean, I've had people come up to me after I give a talk and they say, well, I took a women's history course and I never heard of her. Well, right. <laughs> and that's why I wrote the book. <laughs> and you, you talked about civil disobedience. Now, your new book, which is The Voice of Liberty, which I do not have a copy of. No. You have oh. one right there. Oh, look at that. Oh, look flash the cover book. for us. Yeah. All right. I love this book. Oh. <laughs> it's your it's your brand new picture book. Yeah, it's a picture book. It's my very first picture book. I've been writing one for 30 years, but I never got one published. Um, actually, this it's like civil disobedience, but they weren't really they didn't really do anything civilly disobedient in this book. Okay. Um, they, but something, something not recommended. Well, I mean, no. I wrote it because in the, in the first, in Boring Criminal, there, I had read that um, they were going to protest the Statue of Liberty. Now, why would you protest the Statue of Liberty? They didn't think it was right for Liberty being a woman when women didn't have any rights in the United States. So yes. Was, so the New York Women's State Suffrage Association um, applied to speak at the dedication ceremony, and they were told that no women would be allowed to speak, no women would even be allowed on the island, period. Then they decided that they would sail in this naval parade down the Hudson out to the island, and they applied for that, and they actually got permission to sail in that, so they weren't breaking any laws by this. But they couldn't find a very good boat. And this is what's piqued my interest about the, for the picture book. They had to rent a cattle barge, a smelly, horrible, filthy cattle barge. And the captain promised them that he would clean it up before they had to ride it. No, he did not clean it up. And some of them wouldn't even get on it. But Matilda had a cow in Fayetteville. I mean, she knew what they smelled like. And they took this cattle barge and by some stroke of luck, got the anchor right under the statue, right in the first row, right between two huge battleships. So they did yell at people through a megaphone, but I don't think that was civil disobedience. I don't, the people on the island couldn't hear them, and people yelled back at them, too. And when they're all done, they're, they're, Matilda was really happy because they got on the front page of the New York Times. So that was the best they could hope for, you know? I don't know. That seems like more than I would be willing to do in most cases. <laughs> so, um, all right. So, and it's a great little story. Um, how'd you how'd you get it made into a picture book, Angelica? Well, I'm again. I can't say enough good about the South Dakota Historical Society Press. They decided that they wanted to do a trilogy of books to celebrate the centennial of women's voting. Uh -huh. So the first one was Born Criminal. The second one, I can't remember the title of it, but it's something to do with 
how women got the vote in the Northwest or something like that. And the third one is this book, The Voice of Liberty. Um, and I am so lucky that they found this wonderful illustrator, Edwin Fotheringham, who's much more famous than I am. Maybe we'll get some good reviews because of that, you know. Uh, and his, his illustrations are just amazing. And, you know, every time anything happens with this book, but then when the pictures came, you know, when this book showed up in the mail, I just went crazy. And I'm, I'm, I'm no good then for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, no, I've, I've seen a couple samples of it and it really looks lovely. So I guess I'm going to have to give a few copies as gifts. I guess you are. I think so. All it's right. coming out on September 15th. And I think I get to do a cover reveal, although, yeah, on August 6th. Woo. <laughs> All right. And you know, it's a little weird having the book come out virtually. I mean, it's a real book. Right. And on September 15th, people, they'll be able to order it on August 6th, I think. But, you know, how are we going to promote it? Last, for the last book, I did all kinds of talks for League of Women Voters and AAUW. And, you know, pretty so, extensive touring for Born Criminal. Yeah, it was really, I had a great time. So I don't know what's going to happen with this one, but we'll find out. Uh, loyal club members and Bugle readers will, of course, remember some of what we talked about. Um, from your autumn 2018 issue. Can't quite get on camera, but there it is. Okay. Um, if we turn to page 25, oh, look. So it's the beginning of a great article by you. And it's not only about Born Criminal, it previews Born Criminal, but talks a little bit about your research process. Uh, in creating that book, which I was very happy to publish. Well, thank you. And you, you've got something new coming my way really soon. Um, if people pay attention to their winter bugle this year, they're going to find a brand new article you've written that um, tackles another figure who is related to Matilda. Will you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. I had read Finding Dorothy by Elizabeth Lutz, but that book came out about five months after mine did. And she and I didn't know each other, didn't know we were writing these books on a similar topic. And my book's about Matilda, her book's about Maud, Matilda's daughter. But Matilda's a character in the book, and Maud's a character in my biography. So um, the first time I read it, I was like, oh, that's not right. Oh, my gosh. And I was shocked. But then I read it again for the Oz convention in Louisiana last summer because I was going to be on a panel discussion. And that by that time, I'd kind of gotten over thinking about which little details were not right. Um, and I just thought it was such a nice love story. I really enjoyed it. Um, and then I read it again as I've been writing this article for you. And so now I've read that book three times and I've, um, I've attended two Zoom lectures that she has done. So I, I think I really gained an admiration for her. I, and um, I'm just going to write about some things that the real mod did versus what the fictional mod does. And it's mostly, the book takes, takes two stories, one about Maud when she's young and meeting Frank and getting married. And the second story is about when Maude is a widow in 1938 and she gets involved in the making of the MGM movie, The Wizard of Oz. So there's two storylines and they're interspersed through the book. So I really only address the first. I knew that the second one was all new. There's not really, as far as I know, anything about that. That's true. Right. So it was the first one that I addressed about. I just thought it would be fun to compare the two versions, what I know and what Let's made up or what she used. She used a lot of stuff that was real. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope people like it. I, I think they definitely will. I've read, a, I've read a draft at this point and I have to say that made an excellent morning coffee. So I think everyone's going to <laughs> enjoy that very much. I have to say that's one of the hardest articles I've written. I don't know why. Well, of course, you know, it was 20,000 words, the first draft, so that might be part of it. <laughs> Maybe you just need to write another book. <laughs> yeah, right. Let's write the mod book. 
Right. All right. So what what else is what's what's next? What's in the future? What can we be looking forward to from the constantly uh, working pen of Angelica Shirley? The working keyboard. Um, well, I I have an agent now. Ooh, now this is my third agent. So far, not a one of them has ever sold anything. But you know, I live in hope. And um, I've published two books about Francis Hodgson Burnett, who wrote the, the Secret Garden. And there's no picture book about her. Oh. Yes. Isn't that just bad? So um, one book, The Agent is Shopping Around, is a picture book about Francis Hodgson Burnett. Now that one, I think, that could really make me rich. I believe that could really be. You know, I should have written that L. Frank Baum biography as an adult biography. I would have made a lot more money. Than that. Anyway, I'm writing, I'm with the agent is shopping around this picture book about um, Frances Hodgson. Yeah, and she's just, even today, she was working on her letter. Um, there, were, there were these two sisters named Sarah and Angelina Grimke, who were a generation older than Matilda. Uh, they were born around the turn of the century in 1700 and 1800. And they were some of the first women to speak in public in the United States. They started out as abolitionists. And actually, they were born to a very wealthy slave owning family in Charleston. But they left when they grew up. They hated slavery and they left and they went to Philadelphia, became abolitionists, became some of the first women to speak in public. And then their critics said, well, who are you to talk in public? You can't even vote. So then they took up women's rights, too. Um, so they're just the most excellent women. And I, again, I didn't know much about them, and I'm just enjoying them so much. And I'll tell you, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a big fan of Sarah Gin Grimke's. And she's all in both movies about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She quotes Sarah Grimke at the end. Hmm. So. You know, um, Matilda has put me in a new direction because I, before this, I have been writing about authors, and especially Victorian children's authors. But Matilda has sort of pointed me back another way towards feminism. But the Grimke sisters were authors too, just like Matilda. You know, I mean, very nice to write about authors because they write about themselves, and so you know, they write letters, and right. that's why I like to write about authors. So anyway, those are my two projects. Um, I hope she sells one of them soon. And then I have a picture book about a, a cow, but I don't want to overburden it, you know? <laughs> about a cow who wants to live in a zoo. Oh, that sounds pretty good too. Yeah, I like it. I, like it. I have a granddaughter now, so um, I think I'm lightening up a little bit, you know? <laughs> That's fair. Well, I, I, I guess I want to end by asking you, you know, why should we, you, you may not have an answer to this, but as Oz fans, as people who love Oz, why should we want to read about these stories? Why should we want to read about these women? What, what message do they have to give us that, that kind of translates into the philosophy of Oz? I think anyone who, reads the Oz books, certainly knows that women have the power in Oz. After the, at the end of the second book, Oz will come to power. So it's women who are empowered in Oz. And I don't think it's a coincidence that L. Frank Baum lived a good part of his life with Miss Olga Joss and Cage. And, um, and that Maude also was a big believer in women's rights, just like the mother. And, and L. Frank Baum was too. He was like secretary of the Equal Rights Club in Aberdeen, and um, so so I think that um, he was an unusual man for the time because most men thought it was terrible that women thought they should vote. In, in my in this, the Voice of Liberty, men are always calling them man haters and home wreckers, and but Al Frank Baum really believed it, you know. <laughs> so I guess one reason to read Oz is if you want to know how he. He came to think about women in that way. Um, but the other reason to read Oz is it's just absolutely wonderful. <laughs> yeah. His imagination and his humor and his political jokes and John R. Neal's pictures. Yes. 
Angelica, would you hold up your book one more time so we can see it? Oh, okay. <laughs> and it's available on yeah, September. September 15th. I think you can pre-order it on August 6th. All right. All right. <laughs> Miss of Liberty is her new picture book. Born Criminal is her full biography of Matilda Jocelyn Gage. And if you aren't already a member, a 2020 member of the International Wizard of Oz Club, why not? Because you want to be able to get oh, the bomb bugle this winter. Oh, yeah. And read Angelica's new article all about Maud. So go to www.ozclub.org. And don't make me wave this silly card again. All right. <laughs> Thank you for being with me, Angelica. It's been fun. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to talk to you. It's so nice to see you. I hope I see you in person next summer. I know. We'll work on that. All right? Okay. We'll work on that. Bye. Everybody else, please enjoy the rest of the convention and uh, have a great time in Oz.